Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. I want to take a brief moment and just wish everyone safety and health and everything that goes along with that out in California. The fires are real and people are being evacuated from their homes. I know this happens every year, but this is also a time where I can actually use my voice to wish everyone safety and good health. And I hope that these fires die off soon. People living in or around the areas, El Dorado, Kern, Tuolumne, San Bernardino, El Dorado, Butte, and Calaveras, my heart goes out to you. I wish there was so much more that I could do for you, but I just wanted to let you know that you are being thought of seriously here on Back to Ashes. If you are new here and enjoy what you are hearing, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button and make sure that notification bell is set to all. That way you won't miss any videos that I upload, which tend to be daily. If you are interested in becoming a member or would like to tip me with a coffee, that information can be found down below in the description. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Backwoods Creepy Stories. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. This happened almost two years ago. I had decided to go hiking with my son eight months old at the time, and my dog, Henry, Irish wolfhound, Rottweiler mix. My husband was going fishing with a mutual friend at a state park nearby. I decided to go hike one of the more remote trails in a different part of the park and meet up with them later. I drove to a wooded trail about 10 minutes from where my husband was fishing. It was an early spring day, Still chilly, but tolerable, with the sun shining. I parked the car and got my son ready. He was smiling and laughing. I would wear him in a forward-facing hiking sling in the front of me at the time. Henry was sniffing around and whining excitedly, as if to say, Let's go already. We started off on the hike, and it was a really beautiful, peaceful trail. Towering trees mixed with pine, a crystal clear creek wove its way through the trail at points. We would periodically stop and play, all three of us. About an hour and a half into the hike, we had gone two and a half, maybe three miles, and rounded a narrow bend in the trail when we nearly collided with a gentleman in his late 40s, maybe early 50s. Henry was snarling and lunging for the man before I even completely registered what was going on. I quickly backed up and pulled Henry back the best I could. My bumps were goosed at this point. Henry would not calm down. This was very unusual behavior for him, but not if he was trying to protect us. Trying to talk over Henry, I loudly said, I'm sorry, Henry is just very protective of my son. If you move off to the side, we can pass you. My son was very quiet during this entire exchange, which I found a bit odd. The guy was staring very intently at my son. He then laughed slightly and said, <laughs> Oh, he should be. <laughs> it's a good thing he's with you. Then he mentioned to something around his neck and said, I am just out here taking some pictures. It's a hobby of mine. Except he wasn't wearing any kind of camera around his neck or anywhere that I could see. He had a canteen around his neck. I politely asked him again to step aside so that we could pass. At this point, Henry was sitting down but growling still. Henry would not take his eyes off this guy. I have no doubt that Henry would have eviscerated this man if he had tried anything. And I'm positive this guy felt that. The guy looked at Henry for a few seconds, then at my son again. He took a few steps off trail so there was room to get by and so that Henry couldn't reach him 
as we went by. As I warily walked by him, he was like 10 feet to my left at this point, he muttered something about how he used to be able to see his kids. I kept looking back as he walked away to make sure he wasn't turning around to walk our way. He did continue to stare after us for several minutes, though, until I could no longer see him. We kept hiking and eventually came to an opening point where cars could park. There was no one there, and luckily, I still had cell phone reception. I called my husband. He and his friend came to pick us up right away, and they took us back to my car. There was no sign of the guy we encountered. We went home after that. Henry has since passed away, and I am so sad that my son doesn't get to grow up with him. He was really the best dog ever. I know everyone says that about their own dog, but he really was. So, thanks Henry for being gentle yet fierce. He once went ahead to head with a Florida panther and bear. Two different occasions when we lived in the Everglades, but those are separate stories altogether. And to the photographer in the woods, let's not ever meet again. I'm sorry, you guys. I'm still thinking about my dog, Bastion, who I lost in December. Anyway, upwards and onwards we go. It was a Sunday, early in the morning. I live in the suburbs, but my parents own a farm that I enjoy going to because I get to see my dog. Her name is Molly. She's a mutt, but she's not a tiny dog by any means. At that time, I felt very safe around her and would often take her for walks in a forest that was nearby. The day started off like any other. Me and my dad got in the car, drove around for a while, and arrived at the farm. I immediately get out of the car and hugged Molly. My parents always got angry when I hugged her, since I'd smell like her for the rest of the day. I put her leash on and asked my dad if I could take her for a walk. He always thought that we would just go down a road and back, but I always found it more interesting to take her to the forest. I always felt a certain kind of peace and relaxation there that was unmatched by anything else. So we took a turn and headed towards the forest. Usually when we get there, I'd take her leash off so she could explore on her own. Most of the time, I'd carve my name into the trees or look for anything interesting. I was playing baseball with some rocks and a wooden stick, presumably from an old table, and then I heard it. Molly was barking at something. This wasn't usual when we were in the forest. I thought it was a fox or some other animal, so I quickly grabbed the wooden leg like a weapon. I knew that if it was a fox, I wouldn't attack it, but I had a sense of security while I was holding it. I called out, Molly, Molly, but she just kept on barking. This was very strange for me since she always comes to me when I called her. I followed the sound of her barks and stumbled across a scene I'll never forget. There was a man, probably in his late fifties, half naked, carrying a large machete in one hand and holding moonshine in the other. This was the first time that I stumbled across someone in the woods let alone someone half naked and carrying a big ass machete. He was completely ignoring Molly and hacking away at the ground for some reason. I didn't really know how to handle the situation. Even now, I have no idea how I could handle it. Uh, sir, are, are you okay? I asked in confusion. I don't think I understood the seriousness of this situation at the time. He turned around, revealing his face. He had some of the clearest blue eyes I have ever seen to this day. I could see them as well, because they were wide open. Come here, boy, 
Look what I've dug up. I was afraid that if I didn't listen to him, he would start chasing after me. And that was something I wanted to avoid at all costs. I got closer, but kept a good distance. I didn't see anything, except for an empty hole. He returned to hitting the ground with his machete, occasionally taking sips from the bottle. I used this window of time to get my dog and started walking away slowly as to not notify him that I was leaving. But then I took one more final glance at that man. His head was dug deep into that hole. I was intrigued, so I kept looking. I know, how stupid of me. I finally got up off the ground. I was shocked when I saw him carrying a bone in his mouth. I have no idea what animal that belonged to, if it even did belong to an animal. I had seen enough and started sprinting with my dog. As we ran, I heard him laughing and then I saw something flying from the corner of my eye. It was that damn machete. I heard him yell, Ah, damn it. This made me run even faster. I know the forest very well, so I wasn't afraid of getting lost. I ripped through those branches and bushes until I got out of the forest, but I didn't stop sprinting until I arrived at the garage where my father was testing out lights on our tractor. I didn't tell him a single thing about that man, since I was afraid that he'd get angry and wouldn't allow me to walk Molly anymore. Needless to say, I never went to that forest ever again. Hello. I'm French, so I apologize in advance, as English is not my native tongue. As I just said, I live in France, and the story happened to me this summer, just after the lockdown ended. I was, and am still, 19 at that time. After the lockdown ended, I went to my grandparents to spend a few weeks. I got tested before, no problems there. My grandparents live in a small city in the north of France and they have a dog who's quite a big dog. When I was really young, I lived at my grandparents for a year, and at the time, the dog was only a puppy. Her name is Chippy in French, which kind of means a little devil in English, but in an affectionate way. Considering when I was living there, I played a lot with her. We are both really close, and that will have its importance later. Two of my hobbies are having long walks and running. Thus, every evening, I was going out for a long walk with the dog. There's a track that follows the path through the forest. Then, there's a small hill, and on top of that, a big place with lots of fields there. I run there a lot, so I know the place. The air is fresh, and the view is quite beautiful. So, I was going there with the dog every day. It was also helping my grandparents to have her doing lots of exercise. The first time we went there, nothing special happened. We just enjoyed our walk. It's about six to seven kilometers, so basically an hour long walk. The next day, when we arrived at the top of the hill in the field, it was probably around 10 p.m., but there was still some light because it's summer. There was three other persons walking in the field. They were younger than me probably about 15 or 16. I also noticed that they were smoking, so my guess was that they used to come here so they couldn't be seen by their parents. We went past them. I greeted them, and they greeted back. Once again, nothing special. For a whole week, I did this walk around the same time, 10 p.m., and passed by those three guys with nothing special happening, and it was perfectly fine to me this way. The second week, as usual, I went for the walk with the dog, Chippy, and arrived at the fields. There were only one of the three boys. He wasn't smoking this time, though. When he saw me, I was at the entrance of the field just after the little hill climb, so the entrance of the forest was just behind me. 
He did a sign with his hand to catch my attention and ask if I had a lighter, which I actually had in my pocket. I told him, um, yeah, sure. So he walked to me, his hand in the pocket of his hoodie. When he came near, for some reason, I felt a shiver. It's crazy how sometimes your instinct just knows there's a problem, but you don't listen to it because nothing looks weird to you. I handed over the lighter when we passed by. At that moment, my dog was staring at him. Then, everything happened really fast. He did a really fast movement with his hands coming out from his hoodie, and I only saw something shining. I just had a reflex of throwing myself back so hard that I fell down, and I just realized that he had a knife he was holding, and he just tried to stab me. What saved me is my dog. God bless her soul. When she saw the guy trying to stab me, she jumped on him and he fell down. As I said before, she's a really big dog. I immediately got up to my feet and heard something in my back. From the entrance of the forest, I saw two guys wearing animal masks running to me. They were probably the two other friends. In this moment, your brain acts for yourself. You don't think at all. And in this case, the answer he found was really simple. The other guy was still on the ground. I just watched my dog and told her, run. I started running and she followed me, but I heard the worst possible thing from the guy who got up as well. Catch him. Don't let him go. At this point, I was truly and totally terrified. I was just running, running. I was hearing them running behind me. I was only thinking, how long will they follow me? Who the hell are they? This was the first time I was actually really happy to be a runner. I was clearly better than those guys, and that totally saved me, because they chased for something that felt like an eternity to me. Fortunately, at the end of the field, there's another entrance to the forest, and this time, it's a descent to the road at the end. I heard the steps of the three guys vanish as I arrived at the end of the forest, though I didn't stop running until I arrived at my grandparents' house and locked myself in. I caught a big breath and gave a huge hug to my dog. I saw her eyes that she totally understood what had happened, and I had never been so happy to have her to save my life. After that, I told everything to my grandparents. We called the police, but they didn't find anyone. I don't know what these guys wanted, but the animal masks really made me think about some kind of Satanists. I really don't want to know anyway. I still do long walks with Chippy, the hero dog, but I now go earlier and to places with a little more people. I hope you've enjoyed my story. I apologize again if I've made any mistakes. If you happen to go on walks by yourself, please stay safe and vigilant. I've been wanting to write this story for over a year now, but didn't know if anyone would find it interesting, so here it goes. This happened in the early 2000s, and I was probably in first grade, or maybe a year younger, and this was in Bulgaria. I am from a mid-sized town, not too small and not too big, the perfect one for raising your children. Crime is pretty much unheard of. You can sleep outside on a bench and nothing would happen to you. One weekend, some family members from a nearby town came to my town to visit and my parents and I decided to go to a park with them. Now, it is important to say that all of the parks in my town are located right on the edge of town, so they are actually parks or forests at some point. The park becomes a forest. Since it is not a very big town, we don't have central parks. In the park that we went to, it runs along a river, 
So it is a very narrow alley, but a very long one. And on one side, there is the river, and on the other, there is a thick forest and the cliffs. At that time, I didn't like that park so much because it was a very long walk, and you would have to walk a lot to get to it. So, like most kids, I got bored of walking with my parents and the other family since they were talking grown-up stuff, and I don't want to listen to all that. I decided to run off ahead, and by ahead, I mean out off sight from my parents. Keep in mind that this is a one-alley park, which you walk only straight forward with slight curves due to the river, so... I had gone pretty far. Usually, in this park, there are always people, and it is quite crowded on the weekends. But since it was summer, most people were on family vacations, and it was surprisingly empty, and I couldn't see anyone in a straight line in either way. At that point, I started hearing something in the forest, which was pretty loud since on the other side was the river and it was loud by itself. I stopped and started staring into the forest, and I saw how the bushes were moving and coming into my direction. I was still pretty clueless to what was happening until I saw a freaking man with long hair, a band across his forehead, dressed like a hunter with an air rifle on his back, running full speed towards me. There was no freezing moment. I just started running in the opposite direction and screaming my lungs out for my parents, hoping they could hear me. But because of the river, I doubt that anyone could have heard me about a hundred meters away. I remember looking backward and seeing him still chasing me, and I was thinking, okay, maybe this is the end. It's over and I was imagining how he would catch me and drag me into the forest, and I would never see my family and friends again. It felt like an eternity, but I finally saw my parents and our family friends. My whole face was red. I was crying and snotting like crazy, barely breathing. The hunter had stopped running after he saw my parents and the others. I remember my parents started screaming at him, like... What the hell was he doing? I don't remember what he exactly said. I was just relieved that it was over. But I remember him shaking his head, like saying, I did nothing wrong. I was only trying to help him. The weirdest part was that there is no game in that park. It is a park, after all, and the forest that he was hiding in Maximum 50 meters in width before the cliffs begin. Oh, it is impossible to have any game there since there are always people walking there. You can see wild foxes, but that's about it. You need to go beyond the park out into the forest to hunt game. Also, it is highly illegal to carry a firearm out in public. We have very strict laws on firearms. Only police and military personnel are allowed to carry firearms. I don't know anyone who owns a gun. Civilians are allowed to register only for air guns for hunting. No hardcore weapons allowed. And of course, you are not allowed to carry them in public where there are people. Only in regulated zones for hunting game away from the populated zones. You would never see hunters like that unless you go to these zones or you are in a village, which is still rare. No, we didn't report it afterward. Too much of a hassle. It was the first and last time something like that has happened to me ever, thankfully. And I haven't developed fear from that place. Even now, when I go back to my town... I go running in that park after midnight, and I'm perfectly fine. So, I live in the PNW, which has a great number of excellent campsites. 
A favorite of mine isn't actually a designated campsite, but a forest road right on the river. Being a moody young woman, I would frequently make sojourns in my dumpy Toyota Camry to this spot so I could be alone on the river and meditate on whatever was bothering me. Camping alone has a 20-something female, often inspired anxiety in both myself and my folks, but I didn't let that deter me. Camping alone was something I genuinely enjoyed doing, and after experiencing a series of emotional misfortunes, I need this time to myself. The last time I ever went to this particular spot, I must have been 21. I had just had a closer conversation with someone who broke my heart three months prior and wanted to take some time to process that. Luckily enough, I had gotten consecutive days off for my retail job, so I packed up my car and made a three-hour drive to the spot. The spot is fairly well known, and often a few other campers would be there on weekends. But during the week, it would be more than likely empty. By the time I arrived, it was late afternoon, and I was slightly disappointed to discover a turquoise Chevrolet truck and another silver car parked closest to the river. I parked my distance behind them and began unloading my things. Two young gentlemen were hanging out by the truck, and as I passed by, they greeted me. I muttered hello and just kept walking. I picked a spot I thought was nice and went back to get the rest of my things. As I was passing their cars again, one of the men, the shorter, stockier one, rushed to a boulder near the path where some pistols, as I later learned they were only air pistols, were sitting and quickly concealed them, saying, Oh, sorry about that. I didn't mean to scare you. There was something childlike to his manner, like... He did this specifically so I would pay attention to him. I told him it was fine. I wasn't scared and kept walking. I unloaded the rest of my things, set up my camp, and got a fire going. I was kind of tired after a long day of driving and hauling my stuff around. So I plopped down in a camp chair and got some chili mac cooking for dinner. It was a beautiful evening, not too hot and a golden hour on the river is always a fantastic thing. So, I was thoroughly enjoying the moment. I could see the two men swimming up river a bit, but it was easy enough to ignore them. By the time I finished eating, they passed by my camp on the opposite bank and were walking into the woods. I went down to the bank to get water for my dishes and heard the stockier one call out to me. Hey... I just wanted to let you know that I'm a good guy, okay? Maybe this should have alarmed me more, but it didn't. I definitely thought the guy was socially inept, but left my judgments at that and elected to answer with a polite, Okay. I wanted him to leave me alone and thought that if I was nice but uninterested, he'd take the hint. This was a demonstrably ineffective approach. Some time had passed and I had been musing over the last week's events and just general enjoying the beauty around me when he came limping up to my camp. He was doing a fiend grunt as if he were in pain. I don't exactly remember the exchange we had, but he would wound up sitting at my camp and explaining to me that he had had some injuries in the past that were adversely impacted by the cold of the river. Before I go any further, I'll preface this by saying I was pretty passive as a younger person, especially with strangers. I've definitely had to practice setting and maintaining boundaries as I've gotten older, and this instance demonstrates the danger of failing to do so. I kick myself every time I tell the story, I'm not sure if immediately telling the guy to piss off would have made him leave me alone, being a young, pretty girl alone in the woods, but I regret not speaking my mind more clearly that day. 
All that said, given some previous experiences, I had taken on a policy of engaging in active listening with others who seemed to be struggling. I obviously was faced with my own woes and wanted to be treated compassionately. So I aimed to do the same with others. It was clear the day... Mm, it was clear the guy was having issues and by all exterior judgments seemed like he was just down on his luck even with some maladaptive tendencies. He continued to stay in my camp and began telling me all about his life. These stories were pretty fantastical. The kind of lies a child would tell you of some incredible adventure or grandeur. As they went on, they went into weirder and weirder territory. He explained that the aforementioned injuries that were paining him were the result of a falling a great distance while on a welding job, where his hand was caught by being impaled by a piece of rebar. He described his heroic effect for self-preservation by unhooking himself from the rebar and falling the rest of the distance, breaking his legs or something like that. I gave him a series of, yeah, uh-huh, and Oh, wow, that must have been painful. He revealed that he was recently homeless after splitting up with his girlfriend, who had been talking to another guy. That's why he was staying here in his truck, the aforementioned Chevy. He also told me he DJed at a joint in the closest town and made a lot of money doing it. He increased his exaggerations by telling me he was also a five-star chef, and enlightened me on a gross-sounding dish of his own creation that was essentially a soup made from watered-down fruit jelly and some other sweet things. He also told me that he had once been a Navy SEAL specializing in small arms. It was then he revealed to me that the pistols he thought scared me before were air pistols, and he augmented his tale of being in special forces by demonstrating some twirls with one of them and showing me what ultimately turned out to be some mediocre marksmanship. At a later point, he wound up giving me one of them because he made them. Think of doing bad things. I hesitantly accepted it. I was pretty sketched out by this point and wanted the dude to leave, but lacked the backbone to tell him to go away. Unfortunately, as the evening wore on, he just continued to get weirder and weirder. By this point, he began bringing his belongings from his truck and setting them around my camp. This was a process that happened gradually. Each new conversation note eliciting a new show and tell idea. I can't remember all he brought down, but it included his guitar and a lot of other stuff. He tried to give me some of it, but after the air pistol, I declined. The conversation dragged on, eventually with him telling me in detail about some childhood traumas. His father, who had been in the military, was very strict and often beat him really badly. He also told me about his cousin, who had sexually abused him severely enough to leave scars in certain areas, which he described to me in detail. He got really close to me when he told me this, looking me square in the eye, unblinking. And that's why I never hurt you, he said, still staring at me. I shit you not, my skin started to crawl. I had a few things to defend myself with. A hunting knife and some bear spray. What? He hadn't done anything directly threatening as of yet. Not long after this, his ex-girlfriend showed up. He introduced me as his friend and they talked a little bit before he kind of ignored her in favor of me. The whole thing made me feel even more uncomfortable. She didn't stay long and sped away in her truck, I'm assuming in some bit of jealousy. 
what did I do to deserve that? I didn't say anything other than I was going to bed, hoping he'd take the hint and leave. He said he needed some alone time himself, and I thought I had lucked out. I went into my tent to bed, down for the night as it had gotten dark, only to discover that the cheap ring had been left on my pillow. He must have placed it there when I stepped away to go to the bathroom or something. Furthermore, I could hear him still wandering around my campsite. I peeked out of my tent, and he had his head in his hands as he paced and was muttering to himself. A powerful feeling of needing to flee came over me. There was no way I could stay here even if he didn't do anything to hurt me. He, at minimum, would annoy me the whole three days I planned to stay. I immediately started to pack my stuff, and when he asked what I was doing, I told him I was just going to go. Since I was car camping, I had a bit of stuff with me that would require a few trips, and I hurried to get it all into my car. On one trip, up the path to the parking area. He stood in the middle of the path, complaining that my flashlight was blinding him. I didn't say anything and stepped around him. Most of my trips after that unbothered, though I went with one arm free so I could carry my hunting knife and be ready in case he tried to get physical with me. On my second trip to last trip down, he came out of the dark from the direction of his truck. He was sobbing and cried. But I didn't do anything wrong. I flat out ignored him and ventured down the path once more to grab what I could and hightailed it in my car. I wound up leaving a chord of wood behind, not seeing it worth the danger to go back for it. I shut all of my doors and hopped in absolutely elated at the sound of a 33-year-old car starting right up. I got the hell out of there and drove the three hours back to my house. I didn't have reception until about halfway through the drive, during which point I called my mom and told her what had happened. She was upset that I didn't tell her where I was going. I told my dad and stepmom, who I lived with at the time, and that she was glad I was okay. When I got back, my stepmother asked what I was doing back so soon, and I explained what had happened all over again. My dad later suggested I get a gun if I wanted to continue solo camping, just in case something like that happened again. The next day, I went out to my car so I could drive to meet some friends and found my tire had gone flat. What an immense stroke of luck. It was that. It didn't happen at the campsite or somewhere else in the mountain where I didn't even have reception. I'm in my mid-twenties now and moved to the city about six months ago. My roommate and best friend discovered the air pistol while he was helping me move. He knew I didn't own any guns and was immediately confused, thinking it was real. When he asked me about it, I laughed and explained what happened. I haven't been back to that site since, and while I definitely bring a friend there, I probably won't go down again. So instead, now I go to a second favorite spot that was just below my favorite spot that I just described. Hey guys, I've been wanting to post this story for a while, but I finally now have some time to sit down and write it. I'm a 21-year-old guy. This happened to me back when I was in high school, about five years ago. It was my senior year. Classes were winding down and teachers were finding less to talk about as we were so excited to get the hell out of there. This one teacher I had was super quirky, kind of weird but cool to me as he always had interesting experiences to share. He and my group of friends in the class became acquainted 
among the other students who wouldn't listen to him when he attempted to speak about his past shenanigans. One day, he brought up this oasis, as he called it, a place in the woods we would visit when we were young. It was a clearing deep within the trees, complete with dunes and a small beach, not too far from where we were going to school. We, of course, didn't believe him, so he showed us on Google Maps. Our naive selves thought that after school, we would attempt to reach this place, entering from the backyard, closest to the clearing. We should have known that 40-something years later, the layout of that place would have changed. Come the end of the day, I gather up three of my closest friends. We all agree on the plan of using Google Maps as our GPS. After convincing one of our moms to drop us off, with the lie of hanging out at a friend's place, we made our way to the edge of the forest. God, I wished we called it quits then. It started out all right, I guess, making our way closer by climbing through hordes of bushes and weeds. It was possibly the most run-down, gross, dumped-on parts of the forest, with broken car parts and trash everywhere. Eventually, we did get closer to the supposed clearing. We hear a dog viciously barking in the distance. My alarm bells went off. What was a dog doing in the middle of the damn woods? It was fairly residential, so no hunting, but also no trails or any reason to be out there. My friends were a mix of angry at me for suggesting this and extremely anxious about how we were going to get through it. At this point, we just wanted to make it to the sandy beach part of the woods, which seemed so close judging by our distance on the maps. The closer we got, the louder the barking became. At this point, we weren't saying much to one another, as I led. We were literally up shit creek without a paddle, with nowhere to go. The barking seemed like it was coming from everywhere. I could see a dirt clearing ahead, so I just told everyone to make a break for it. At least in the open, we could see what was coming at us. This was not the clearing we were hoping for, and one I could not find on the map when I tried to look for it later. Off in the distance was a medium-sized makeshift building. It appeared to be made out of plywood, painted gray and black. Above the door hung a giant animal skull with horns. I felt a pit in my stomach because I immediately knew this was the source of the barking, being as it was at its loudest. After managing to snap a picture, I stood there frozen, unsure of what to do. I came back to my senses when I hear a deep and angry voice shout, Hey, what the hell are you doing? From somewhere close to the building, I had officially had enough of the situation. I'd gotten all my friends in this mess so I felt responsible for their safety. I told everyone we're just going to have to bite the bullet and run blindly through the woods. It could have been my mind playing tricks, but I swear I felt like the dog was chasing us, almost like somebody let it loose. After kicking through some really dense wilderness and trees, we were scraped up and bloody by the time we got far enough away that we felt safe. Huddled together and practically crying, I called my mother and told her the mess we were in. I gave her the street closest to the side of the woods we were on, and she gladly came and picked us up. She said when she saw us on the side of the road, it looked like we had been through hell and back. After that day, we barely spoke about it. We didn't even tell the teacher who started the whole thing in fear of somehow getting him into trouble. Okay, so this happened to me earlier. 
and I don't think I'll be sleeping tonight. I'm currently staying in a remote part of the United Kingdom and having a break from working, which means more time to pursue my hobbies. One being photography. I had scoped out a creepy looking tree formation in a nearby forest and set my camera up and tripod as the sun was coming down, you know, for that extra creepy vibe. As I'm happily taking photos, I saw a woman pass the entrance to the arched trees. This woman had parked her car next to mine when I had arrived. She went past a couple of times, looking at me for prolonged periods, with each time she passed. I assume she wants to come up this path, but sees that I'm taking photos, so decides to walk elsewhere. Approximately five minutes go by, and she appears again, this time walking towards me, dragging her left side slightly with a strange limp. She stops once and stares at me for a few seconds, then starts walking towards me again. I ask her if she's okay. I'm starting to put my camera away at this point and readying my tripod to use for self-defense if necessary because the vibe I'm getting is way off. And she starts grunting at me, then stops and stares again. It's at this point that this woman is close enough for me to realize that she's actually a man in a woman's clothing with a wig. An uncomfortable moment passes and she starts grunting again, walks towards the edge of the path, grabs a pile of leaves and starts throwing them around, grunts some more and then walks off aimlessly into the forest. I call my friend to tell her what has happened and ask that she stays on the phone in case this person comes back. I'll just take a couple more photos and then I am out. For a good 10 minutes, I hear the crunching of leaves circling me in the forest, and I just convince myself that it's the wildlife. Then, silent. I take the photos, and I haven't seen or heard the person for about 15 minutes now so I assume I'm safe. I leave the path and see that the car has gone. Thank fuck. However, I very quickly notice that there is a man walking towards me from the entrance. It's the same fucking guy. He has changed into men's attire, and as he walks past me, he shoots me a grin that sends shivers down my spine. I don't scare easily, but this guy just gave off all the wrong signals, causing this overwhelming feeling of dread to wash over me. I'm still on the phone at this point and holding my tripod over my shoulder, you know, just in case. I quickened my pace and got back into my car. As I did so, I saw him come out of the lane I had been down stop and look around, then started walking towards my car with intent. This part is all on video. I record for a while and then haul the fuck out of there, driving past his car that he had moved down the road and thinking, what in the gray beard fuck just happened? Limping, leaf-throwing forest stalker. I hope we never meet again. All right, dear listeners, as I promised, I'm ending this video with a subscriber story. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. This doesn't have a title, but was written by Mrs. Quasi. So my story begins about seven years ago. I was a new mother and was given the task of setting up a moving company to myself, my six-month-old, and my husband to a new apartment. I called a few and got a few prices. Finally, I found one that I thought would fit our budget, as we had a very small studio apartment to move. 
The man I spoke to, I'll call Mr. X. He told me he would have to come over and see the place and then would give me a final price for the move. I told him that would be fine as long as my husband was home to deal with him. We were stationed overseas and it is just easier for the man of the house to deal with any business matters. I made an appointment with Mr. X on a day my husband would be home. Mr. X arrived on time as soon as I opened my door. I felt something was off. I just got a very creepy feeling from this man. Yet, I was polite and led him to our living room. He spoke with my husband as I tended to our daughter. I could feel this man's eyes on me, and I looked up and just smiled. I sat down next to my husband and listened as the two men as they spoke. The whole time, Mr. X's eyes never left me. I just thought to myself, hmm, this must be the way it works here. Maybe he doesn't think he is being weird. Well, my husband and Mr. X set a price and a date to move us. My husband said I would have to be home alone, our daughter, when we were moved. My stomach sank, but I was not going to put up fuss over a feeling. I could have been totally overrating it. The day came for the move, and Mr. X had been sending me messages via text, saying, Would you like me to bring boxes? I can bring anything for you that you'd like. I can do anything for you. I want to do anything for you. You are such a beauty. I just simply replied, Oh no, thanks. We are all set. I have packed everything. Mr. X arrived at my door at the appointed time. He had brought five other men with him to help move us. I greeted each man in the manner that was expected of me via culture. The man spoke amongst themselves in their language and... I sat down tending to my daughter. I had to keep her calm as she was nervous around strangers. Mr. X kept his eyes on me each and every time he came into the house to move things. His colleagues ignored me pretty much unless they needed to ask me something or tell me something. Mr. X stopped to talk to my daughter in this sickening sweet tone. I held her tighter in my arms as she began to scream. He smiled at me and said, Both mom and child, such beauties. Of course, English is not his first language. He picked up something heavy, and I reminded him to please be careful with himself. That was the first mistake as he grinned at me and winked, saying, Oh, pretty girl, don't worry. I am strong. I can take it. I can even hold you up. The men finished after three hours and finally my husband came home. I told him all that I had been through and he told me that is how they are here. They do not understand some things. My husband, of course, stayed close to me and our daughter for the rest of the time that they were there loading up the truck. At one point, I was alone with Mr. X again as my husband carried something to the car. I walked around the house one last time and noticed Mr. X following me. I was holding our daughter and sweetly said to her, Okay, say bye-bye to our first home. Mr. X made an odd mm, sound as I turned to see him looking me up and down. I brushed past him and he shut the door, smiled at me, saying, you are too sweet. You are too kind. Your husband sure is a lucky man. I work out. I take care of myself. I wish my wife was like you. So fit. So small. I said, Um, okay. Well, my husband is waiting. I need to go. He followed me down the stairs all the while saying, Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. I walked faster, as fast as I safely could go, down the stairs with my daughter in my arms. I got in the car and told my husband. Of course, he was very, very upset 
and said he would speak to the man. He, of course, did when we arrived at the new place, and it seemed to not even phase Mr. X. He kept on watching me and smiling. He would come and say things to me every now and then, but I stopped even listening and kept my daughter pinned to me in her carrier. The men unpacked us and were paid. Then, finally, they left. I thought, thank God, that is the end of that. Nope. Not in the slightest was this over. He found me on Facebook, through the group I hired him in, and began sending me messages, sending me kissing faces or love quotes and pictures. He even sent me a few selfies of himself. I just left everything on scene, and of course, showed my husband each time. Of course, we knew we could report anything because, as well, he had not broken any laws. Well, this kind of thing continued for a while, and he would tell me how pretty I was, or how he wished his wife was like me, how fit and sexy I was. I finally blocked him, but he made another account and kept up the same ways. Finally, he left me alone for about a year, but he found me again recently and has been asking if I am still in the country, if I am married, and if I want to meet up, that he will do anything for me, that he would love to see me again because I was a beauty, that I was so amazing that I was a good mother, just anything he could think of to try to get my attention to him. I once again blocked this account. Once again, he made another account, saying he knows where I live. He will come by and pick me up so we can hang out. I said, no, my husband will not approve, and I do not want to. He says, why are you such a beauty? Please, I'll be here for you. I like you. I want to see you. I said no and blocked him. I know this story is not like a lot of the others I listened to, but still, this was scary to me. And now I am way more careful with how I speak to people. I make sure I am never alone with any strangers or movers. I make sure my husband is home or a friend is here with me. I seriously hope I never see Mr. X again. Mrs. Quasi, thank you so much for sharing that story. It was quite intriguing. And that, dear listeners, brings an end to these true backwoods creepy stories. But before I move on, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes and the gifted members of Back to Ashes. Patty's niece, Samantha Place, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Chrissy Elias, Denise S., Tina Mead, Luz Crispin, Tammy Slayton, Anita B., Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Amy Klimko, Sugared Spite, Mrs. Enerscare, and Anita B. Thank you all for remaining the pillars on which Back to Ashes stands. I am deeply humbled and grateful for you. Our Gifted Memberships the Conspiracy Archives, Grimm's Library, Adam Grigg, Nat Davies, and The Cryptid Sleeps. I hope you all enjoy your time here. There's plenty of vocal melatonin to go around. And also to the subscribers and other listeners, thank you so much for tuning in and supporting Back to Ashes. Without any of you, I would not have a voice. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this selection. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all. <laughs>